So I just want to welcome everyone that's here with us uh, to the fifth webinar in this series of nine uh, looking at breastfeeding. So I am Ernestine Gayonza and I'm the Associate Dean for Law and Policing here at York St. John University. So I research on shared parental leave and breastfeeding and currently working on breastfeeding and its wider benefits. So I recently launched, I'm sure many people know about this already, but I recently launched a documentary on breastfeeding, which I titled it, Breastfeeding Not on the Agenda. Um, the event right that you, well, through the event right, uh, you would have had the links to the documentary, but if you haven't, please drop me a message in the Q&A and I'll send you the link again. But the documentary was highlighting the challenges as well as the benefits of breastfeeding, not just to health, but to work, to the environment and to the economy as well. But most importantly, it was really highlighting that need for breastfeeding to be put on the agenda, which currently we don't have breastfeeding on the agenda, such as education, family friendly rights and the environment. Now I can't help it, we are, celebrating the world's breastfeeding uh, week this week. And the theme is making breastfeeding and work work. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have that because in the UK, we don't have a legal framework to support breastfeeding mothers in the workplace. So if you want to join me in my ranting, so the documentary is there and there's a petition as well calling on the government to put breastfeeding on their agenda and to go with the theme of this week to put breastfeeding on the family friendly policies, make breastfeeding a policy to support mothers in the workplace. So um, I am very pleased to welcome Helen Gray with us today. Uh, Helen is a joint coordinator of the World Breastfeeding Trend Initiative Project in the UK. Helen is the policy and advocacy lead for lactation consultants of Great Britain. So she's a lot in one. Uh, she represents La Leche uh, League of Great Britain on the UK baby friendly baby feeding law group which works to bring the international code of marketing of breast milk substitute um, into the uk law we know that there's been quite a lot for those of you who've been following the lancelet uh, uh series on formula milk and its impact you will know how important this work is so helen's background is anthropology and human uh, evolution and she has, inf and has influenced her uh, interest in how breastfeeding and the way we nurture our babies and influenced by both human biology and culture. So our current advocacy focus is the need for strong policy to protect infant feeding in emergencies. She has written several articles and chapters on the subject and served on the advisory panel for London Food Resilience Research Project. She now, she now represents Baby Friendly Law Group on the Global Infant Feeding in Emergencies Core Group. What a great job you're doing, Helen. And I'm very pleased to say Helen will be, uh, Helen's talk today is titled Ready for Disaster, Infant and Young Child Feeding in Emergencies in Europe and the UK. So very welcome to you, Helen. I'm delighted to have you here. So over to you, Helen. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and see if we can get, how's that? Does that look? Right? Okay, great. Um, so again, thank you all for coming to listen to me today. Our topic today is infant and young child feeding in emergencies. So it's a little outside the main theme of World Breastfeeding Week, which is really looking about at enabling breastfeeding in the workplace. But I think if anyone's seen Ernestine's documentary or listened to the webinar series, you'll realize that actually they're all aspects of breastfeeding from how our health professionals are trained to what government policies we have in place. It's, it's really a, an all encompassing need for better policies 
And um, so this is one area of that. This particular talk will be looking at infant and young child feeding in emergencies in the UK and Europe. Are we ready for disaster? My disclosures are that um, I have written chapters on this topic in uh, two, two books, the Guide to Supporting Breastfeeding for the Medical Profession and the Positive Breastfeeding Book. And I'm the joint coordinator of the WBTI UK project, which investigates UK policy. I've received no payment for any of these, and I have no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, let me find my button there. Uh, so I'll just pop quickly to our headline from our WBTI report on UK policies and programs in, with regard to infant feeding. We did the very first assessment UK-wide in 2016, and our findings on planning and preparedness for infant and young child feeding in emergencies in the UK was that a resounding zero out of 10 um, Scotland got one point you can see on the chart here because they'd actually named one their national infant feeding lead as the person responsible for infant feeding in case of emergencies, but there were no accompanying um, programs at that point. Um, one of our rather alarming findings was that there is UK government guidance for providing for animals, including pets, livestock, zoo, and circus animals, not even sure that our circuses have animals anymore in this country, but there's no mention of mothers and infants. There's an assumption that parents will be responsible for their own children, um, and there's really nothing mentioned until till children are at school age when the school will have responsibility for having an emergency plan in place. There are uh, international standards and guidance that we could use. And here you can see, this is the global guidance on infant and young child feeding in emergencies, operational guidance for emergency relief staff and program managers. This has been developed by the Infant Feeding in Emergencies Core Group, the IFE Core Group, which is a consortium of global humanitarian organizations and others who support infant feeding and um, have decades, decades of experience and evidence based on what works and doesn't work. So this is a very practical set of guidance that covers most of the general issues that anyone might need to plan for. It's all about planning and preparedness. And also another disclaimer is that um, I now represent Baby Feeding Law Group UK as a, um, at the IFE core group. Uh, Baby Feeding Law Group, BFLG, have just become a member. So why do we need these guidance? People often think that disasters um, and emergencies are really something that happened to people far away and we don't have to really worry about them here. We live in this developed industrialized country in the UK and other European countries. But of course, disaster can strike close to home. We have dramatic earthquakes in some countries. This illustration is from earthquakes in Italy and um, this, study actually i don't know if the um ernestine is the command bar blocking the top of the slide or is that invisible for you um okay uh well i'll, I'll read it out anyway that um the doctors who did this particular study of the 2009 abruzzi earthquake interviewed mothers who had been pregnant or breastfeeding during or in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. Um, and their conclusion really is the theme of any talk on this subject, which is that dealing with emergency, infant feeding in emergencies is a matter of getting it right in preparation. Before the disaster strikes, it is critical to develop in ordinary time structured and multi-sectoral planning and specific professional training. So we'll see this and how it plays out in the UK. Just find my button again, there we go. Um, I used, in this talk, I used to have a, a picture of a wildfire in Greece that I thought was pretty dramatic until I saw this one a couple of weeks ago. We've all seen 
how the wildfires in Greece have impacted not only the Greek people, but thousands and thousands of British tourists. And here we can see a picture of tourists evacuating in a hurry from their hotels as the fires approach, really leaving in swimsuits and flip-flops, walking miles, carrying children, breathing smoke. Um, and so that was a real shocking wake up call, I think for a lot of people in the UK. Another tragic fire that's been, that affected residents of the UK was the Grenfell Tower catastrophe. And um, in the aftermath of that, the late great Heather Tricky and I produced this article on protecting babies in emergencies with a simple outline of what's needed in terms of guidance in the UK and really what we saw lacking in the care provided to families with infants in the aftermath of that terrible fire. First of all, it's important to have a proper needs assessment. You need to know how many babies are breastfeeding, how many babies need formula before you can even begin to prepare. And that is based on good data collection. And unfortunately, in recent years in England, we've seen very, well, a lot of gaps in local data collection in terms of infant feeding rates, breastfeeding rates, formula feeding rates. And if local authorities don't have that information, they don't even know how many babies are going to need formula in terms of what they need to provide, how many babies are going to need support with breastfeeding. So that needs to happen in the preparedness phase and then immediately in the disaster, the needs assessment of the people who are on the spot. Skilled feeding support is gonna be needed by all families with young children because everybody is going to be very stressed and uh, life is gonna be very difficult, especially if you have a baby or a toddler. So breastfeeding mothers are going to need skilled feeding support to keep breastfeeding going successfully and formula feeding families as well. Oh, I've lost my button again. There it is. Uh, formula feeding families are also going to need a whole support package. They will need access to clean water, to a formula that's appropriate for the age of their baby and med any medical needs, and safe preparation facilities and equipment. We have guidance from the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes and the Infant Feeding and Emergencies Operational Guidance on how to set up these things, but also how to manage the appeals for donations that tend to flood in in every emergency. People are so generous and there are many appeals for things to help and people first think of the babies and they send bucket loads of infant formula or bottles or breast pumps. They might be sent by concerned individuals, by community, organizations, even by global NGOs, and they're definitely sent by companies. But if you can imagine, in a disaster, these people are not in their kitchen with access to clean water and a kettle and a fridge to prepare these things safely or clean and sterilize them safely. All of these have the potential for contamination and bacteria and could make a baby ill. And that's why it's really important not to just be sending masses of this, these products to a disaster site and have them distributed indiscriminately. It's really important that they're distributed to those families whose needs have been identified in that needs assessment, because there will always be babies who need formula. There will always be need for the equipment. Somebody needs it, but not everyone. And just to make sure that it's always accompanied by that support package so they can be used appropriately and safely and by, with skilled feeding support to make sure that the families are able to feed their babies well. The key message for the public really is donate dollars, donate pounds, not stuff, uh, because you're, you're really just burdening the local responders with boxes of old sweaters or jumpers or, or formula, and then they have to distribute it. And it's much easier if you give them funding and then they can distribute the purchase what's needed on the spot. This is a really vivid illustration of the hazards of 
donating formula and bottles and so forth. This picture is not that far away. It's a picture of refugees in Northern France trying to get to the UK. So this is on our doorstep. And I've visited some of these refugee encampments and you've got families with babies and young children living in a tent in the woods. They don't have a bathroom. They don't have a kitchen. There's maybe one tap or hose pipe in a muddy field. And there's nowhere to really wash out and clean or sterilize equipment no, or a way to boil water. And um, to be honest, the families that I met in those encampments, many were breastfeeding, but many were also giving formula. Maybe they worried that they didn't have enough milk or they were stressed about keeping the babies quiet at night so the police didn't find them. Anyway, every family that I spoke to whose baby was receiving formula, the baby had had diarrhea while they were camping. And if you can imagine, it's hard enough in our own homes when our children have a, a tummy bug with vomiting or diarrhea, and we've got showers and bathrooms and washing machines, um, and how hard it is for these families. So when we give these products, it's not without harm. And it's really much better to fund the agencies who can set up a proper feeding station and provides clean and safe food for the children and babies. So here we are back to the UK. A more common natural disaster that we have is flooding, it happens so frequently now. And this is a really good illustration of quite a, a lot of risks coming together for one baby. Um, and if we were in person, I'd be asking you to shout out which risks you see in place. So take a moment and look at this photo and you'll see, well, so we have a baby who is bottle feeding in this boat in a flood. Well, all around her is probably contaminated water because that's, that's pretty frequent in a flood to have sewage contaminate the water all around and the whole situation. So she's really exposed to a lot of extra pathogens. And if she's not, if she's having formula in her bottle, then her immune system is already not as strong to deal with those pathogens she's being exposed to. Of course, she's going to need access to clean water to prepare her next bottle and a supply of formula. And her bottle's going to need to be cleaned because the bacteria can grow in that in the formula in the bottle. So we're hoping that wherever she's going has got a proper sort of milk kitchen set up for her. Um, although we don't have evidence that that's very common in the UK at this point. And finally, this baby, we don't see her with her mother. And we know that separating mothers and babies is, has serious consequences for their health and well-being. And keeping mothers and babies together really should be a central principle in any plan like of this kind. So when, in the UK, when we have a water crisis, whether it's flooding and water contamination or water cuts for other reasons, um, there are steps put in place to get clean water to the people. One method in this uh, situation in Gloucester in 2007 is Bowser's big containers of water and people come up and fill their own containers. And um, you can see there's a warning on the container drinking water, it is advisable to boil before use. So this is clean water, but it may not be clean by the time you've put it into your container and carried it to your home. So it, you're advised to boil it. I will say that when we did our WBTI research, the first round in 2015, 2016, um, we didn't find any national guidance on infant feeding and emergencies from the government but we found one set of guidance from the Food Standards Agency on um, how, how to feed babies, what to do about water after flooding and contamination. Um, and I wish I could read it to you, but unfortunately it's it disappeared from their website. But let's hope that um, that's because they're developing better guidance. And I will say also that there's no evidence that other emergency planning agencies in this country have even read that or 
incorporated it into their own planning. This is what we're talking about, multi-sectoral planning. You know, what the water agencies and the food agencies are doing should be incorporated with the health agencies and nutrition and, you know, all the, all the sectors who are preparing for an emergency. Um, now, I, I actually experienced water cuts in my own neighborhood in South London when the water mains burst. And for several days, the water, uh, there was a whole neighborhood without water, which actually is a neighborhood that has one of the higher rates of uh, babies in the UK. And I talked to mothers who were really struggling because maybe they had just given birth and coming home and they couldn't even bathe or they were recovering from a cesarean or they had a baby and toddler or someone in the house had a tummy, a vomiting bug. And the um, water companies were providing everyone with 10 liters of water per person per day at these staging areas, sort of supermarket car parks and so forth. For, forth. But families who didn't have a car, who had a baby and toddler, found it very difficult to go and actually transport all this heavy water back to their homes. One thing I discovered interviewing the water company is that families with babies and children can actually apply to get on the priority register of all the utility companies. And it's really worth doing that so that when there's an emergency, hopefully they'll come and find you and you don't have to traipse across town to find them. So what about this 10 liters of water per person? That's the official guidance here. Is that enough for a baby with an infant? Well, research by Carleen Gribble and Nina Berry in Australia suggests that formula fed infants who are fed ready to feed liquid formula need 12 out liters of water per day to get hands clean, the surface clean, the utensils cleaned and sterilized. And babies who need, are using powdered formula, those families need 24 liters a day to safely prepare that baby's formula. So our general guidelines of 10 liters per day, per person per day, don't really cut it for families who've got formula dependent infants. So it's not only national, natural disasters that affect us, but man-made too. And um, even across Europe, things are definitely being felt in this country. And who would have thought we would see war again in Europe? There's a study of the earlier conflict in 2015 in Eastern Ukraine that found that conflict-related stress was a single most common reason for mothers to stop breastfeeding before six months. And in fact, 45% of mothers stop, I believe, stop before six months um, exclusive breastfeeding. And you can imagine in this situation, with frequent power cuts, uh, bombing alerts, having to go into the basement, how difficult it is to prepare formula safely, not to mention the supply chain and whether your shop's got it in stock or not. Um, Another interesting aspect of that study was that they found that in, in, in that population, exclusive breastfeeding under six months was around 20%, and that at one year, 50% of the mothers were still breastfeeding. So this is a population that's actually doing a lot more breastfeeding than we're used to in the UK. And so we should really think about our automatic reflex to send formula um, because this may be a group who would benefit from support with breastfeeding um, when they either at, in the Ukraine or when they're displaced and come as refugees into our country. This war has also brought the unthinkable upon us and the infant feeding in emergencies core group has developed, recently developed guidance in case of chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threats, and the impacts on breastfeeding safety on infant and young child feeding. It's horrible to think we even need this, although I'm very grateful to those in the IFE core group who put so much work into providing this resource, and I hope that our governments will actually at least incorporated into uh, their planning. 
Now, all these natural disasters that we've seen around the world and many wars have contributed to a, the refugee crisis that we've experienced in Europe in recent years. This map will probably ring a bell with many of you. It shows the passage of over 1 million people by sea into Europe in 2015. And you can see here, they're coming from Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Southern Africa, all, all over. And many, the majority through Greece, and then at that time they were walking up through Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, and into Western Europe. Um, this is, uh, they, subsequently the borders were closed and so the numbers look a little different in terms of how people got to different places. Um, but this uh, experience was reflected in whether those countries actually developed guidance for infant and young child feeding in emergencies. In 2020, um, our WBTI coordinators around Europe did a review of the 18 countries who had done a WBTI report. And this is the um, average scores for the 10 main policy and program indicators across those 18 countries. And you can see on the right, circled in blue, indicator number nine, that's infant and young child feeding in emergencies. And what this shows is that across 18 countries, the average was 1.61 out of 10, which really means most countries had zero preparation, zero strategy or planning. But there were a couple of countries, and they're the countries that those refugees passed through, um, who in response to that crisis had started to develop national strategies and guidance. Here you see the global picture from 2016. Um, this is a, a map, a chart of 84 countries around the world. And the blue arrow on the left shows you the United Kingdom proudly leading a parade of zeros. So what resources do we have to develop better strategy planning and guidance? The UK is a member of the World Health Assembly and the World Health Assembly, the WHA, has passed two resolutions specifically dealing with planning and emergency preparedness for infant and young child feeding in 2010 and 2018. And they specifically call on governments to implement the evidence-based operational guidance that I showed you into their own national planning. The Infant Feeding and Emergencies Core Group has a whole host of resources on their website you probably can't quite use this little QR code, but if you look up the infant feeding IFE core group on the Emergency Nutrition Network website, you'll find all of this. Um, so here you have actually on the lower left, again, too small for you to see, but I recommend going to the website and looking at them individually, a series of infographics that have been, um, were developed in 2021 to really, give flow charts for emergency responders and managers and planners on handling specific aspects of infant and young child feeding, such as um, how to handle, set up a, a safe formula feeding uh, pathway or how to manage donations, things like that. And then on the right, on the top, you can see the IYCFE repository. That's a pretty new resource. It's a research repository, a library of research about infant and young child feeding globally, and that is regularly updated. You can go to the website and sign up for quarterly updates, um, and that has a lot of useful information in it. Another new set of resources that's just coming online is the BIB study in Australia. This is the study of the babies in the Black Summer of bushfires in Australia. And it's led by the Australian Breastfeeding Association and Western Sydney University, funded by the Australian government. And the, main, the lead researcher, Carlene Gribble, has, um, is a member of the Infant Feeding and Emergencies Core Group and has extensive experience in emergencies. 
one of the key messages, uh, which became the title of their report, which if the command bar is not blocking the top of your page, you can see it says, uh, want to help babies, then help their parents. And, and it's so true. If you remember what I was saying about how the government in the UK expects parents to really do the planning and look, look after their children. Um, so when the, the Bibbs team went and actually interviewed loads of parents who'd experienced the, the fires, they'd been had to evacuate. And, um, you know, they universally said, we really didn't know what to do. We didn't know what we needed to pack. We didn't know how much time to allow. We wish we'd had more time. And, and so parents really do want this sort of guidance. One of the members of our WBTI team, Patricia Wise, did a survey of the websites of local re resilience fora around the, U the UK. Well, in England and Wales, there are 42. And I believe she found that 27 had some mention of supplies for infants or children in their, their list for their emergency grab bag for parents to pack. But for, in 18 of those, it was just very general. It wasn't specific how much you need to take or how many days supplies you need or anything like that. Um, so we, this is why we call for a national standard, national guidance to make sure that every local resilience forum has the kind of information that parents need. And also that responders um, and planners can be prepared and their facilities are ready for families with young children, which was another aspect of the Sydney of the um, Australian study, the wide variability and, and sometimes total unsuitability of the emergency accommodation, um, whether it might not have kitchen facilities, there were places where uh, here, and also this happened in a Canadian evacuation from wildfires where families were washing and preparing their baby's bottles and preparing formula in the toilet sinks um, because there's no kitchen. And another aspect of having large groups of people crammed into maybe a sports hall accommodation is rapid spread of things like norovirus. So in the same bathroom, you have people vomiting and diarrhea and people are making up their baby's bottles. And you can just imagine the risk, it just makes my head explode. If I was an emergency planner, that would really be the pits. Um, so I think this is something we just need to raise awareness. Nobody's doing this on purpose. It's just that nobody's thought of the needs of babies and young children and their families. I mentioned health professional training earlier. This is another aspect of our WBTI research. We map out the high level training standards of each health profession that work with uh, babies and, their, and women of reproductive age and mapped out against an educational checklist from the World Health Organization. Again, I apologize, it's much too small for you to read on the slide, but it's a two-page spread in our report and it's all, that's all available free online on our WBTI website. So you can get up close to it um, after you've watched this, uh, this um, presentation. And uh, we'll send around a list of a bibliography and, and list of resources for you. So across the top are some of the 25 topics in that checklist. And the far right one is infant and young child feeding in emergencies. And the column down the left is the different health professions. The first row is midwives. The second row, nurse. The third row, health visitor. The fourth row, the health visitor programs that use a baby friendly accredited curriculum. The next row, pediatricians, then obstetricians, GPs, dietitians, and then the bottom two as comparisons to the health professionals, IBCLC lactation consultants, and breastfeeding counselors. And you can see if you look down the right-hand column, there's almost nothing in the required training of our health professionals on dealing with infant and young child feeding in emergencies. So that's one of the things that we're calling for, and I know it's in Ernestine's petition as well, is to get much stronger required basics on infant feeding into our health professional training standards. So what do responders need to know? Well, first of all, if the mother is breastfeeding, 
then it's important to provide any support she needs to keep breastfeeding so you don't have to start bringing in formula supplements in that very tricky time. Secondly, if she's mixed feeding, then she may want support to increase breastfeeding and reduce the need for formula and bottles during the emergency. If the family is formula feeding, then it, it's important to ensure access to formula supplies and that preparation package, clean water, clean facilities, and so forth. If the emergency goes on for any length of time, mother, some mothers may wish to relactate and it, they will need some skilled support to do so. It's vital to signpost parents to skilled support and also to mother baby spaces, which we hope, we didn't talk much about it yet, but we hope that will be part of the preparation and planning that rest centers will have some dedicated parent child or, or mother and, and child spaces where they can safely care for their children. And the Australian study outlines some of the facilities they would need there. Um, and finally, collaborate across sectors. Wash, that's uh, water and sanitation and hygiene, food, shelter, gender issues. In an emergency, there are sectors look, working on all of these and infant feeding cross cuts them all. So let's make sure that everyone is talking to everyone else and is supporting families with infants and young children at this very vulnerable time. Our WBTI team has developed a various resources. We've got a number of blogs about infant and young child feeding on our website. This is the one I mentioned earlier that I co-wrote with Heather Tricky. Um, I also put together a library of resources in Afghan languages uh, when the evacuate, that sudden evacuation of, of families from Afghanistan happened. Um, I likewise, at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, we put together a library of resources in Ukrainian. We also recognize the power of social media in communicating messages um, to parents and especially sort of bite-sized messages, which is really all you can take in one at a time in an emergency or a crisis. And modeled after the European Safely Fed group and the Canadian uh, Safely Fed social media work, um, we set up a Facebook page called Safely Fed UK, Infant and Young Child Feeding in Emergencies. Um, we first set that up when Hurricane Ophelia was headed to our shores and, and she was still a hurricane at that time. And uh, we had some help from the Canadian Safely Fed team to develop some simple message memes. You can see in the middle, there's one for uh, responders working in a rest center or shelter on how to, what they need to know about safe infant feeding in an emergency. Um, and it's not just a meme because on social media and it would link to um, different resources and have all the complete information accessible. But when parents are scrolling through their phones, it, there would be a bit of an eye-catching graphic to sort of get one message across and then they could click and read more about it. Um, the second graphic shows that um, actually storms like Ophelia uh, can bring flooding and also power outages. And um, so for mixed families who are mixed feeding, in this case, um, there's a whole range. We have a whole range for um, people who are breastfeeding or formula feeding or mixed feeding. But if they're feeding at breast and with the bottle, that while the power's out is a time to breastfeed more often until things are back to normal and your body will start to make more milk for your baby. In the USA, Hurricane Katrina was a real turning point on preparedness for infant feeding in emergencies. Uh, before that, they had literally nothing. And they've, there's a number of things have been developed since then. And this is an info sheet from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And um, I really like this key strategy that they emphasize. Increasing the current rate of breastfeeding in the United States is fundamental to opti optimize infant nutrition when disaster strikes. So this is really part of our population resilience. Um, the more families we can support, the stronger off that those families will be in an emergency. We have another type of crisis, long-term crises in the UK, food insecurity and the cost of living crisis. 
UNICEF Baby Friendly UK, along with NIFIN and First Steps Nutrition Trust, developed the guidance you see here on the left for local authorities and health boards who are supporting families with infants and who are experiencing food insecurity. This lays out the pathways needed to support families no matter how they're feeding their baby, the kind of emergency backup that's needed and has case studies and examples of best practice. And I highly commend that. I would encourage everyone who is listening to this webinar to ask your local authority or your health board what they have in place and are they using this very useful guidance? Um, First Steps Nutrition Trust has, has done a, they've a whole range of related reports, such as this one on the right about the security of our infant's food supply. Um, and also they've got specific reports on the cost of living crisis. And of course, they always keep, have an up-to-date report on the costs of infant formula and so forth. So their website is a very, very useful resource um, for anyone who is interested in this topic or doing any planning. In addition, infant feeding has a big impact on the climate crisis, and it's really important for how our families are prepared. First of all, obviously the production and use of formula contributes to climate change um, because it has a, a green, greenhouse gases, carbon footprint and a water footprint um, that can't be denied, they are significant. And of course, we will, there will always be families who need to use formula, um, but every family who wants to breastfeed and is supported to breastfeed successfully has that much more, uh, they have a lower footprint themselves and they contribute to being a more resilient population. There's a nice suite of climate smart infant feeding um, resources uh, on the left here that uh, are in the, the bibliography. So I, I commend those and there's an awful lot more re research coming out nowadays. In fact, there's a new tool from Australia N National University called the Green Feeding Tool where you can calculate the actual carbon footprint of your um, infant feeding in your country. So that brings us, as we sum up, to the recognition that while we all have our own part to play, it is our government's responsibility and national policies that will really make the change here. And research on middle and high income countries has found, well, a lot of this is gonna ring a bell for those of us in the UK. They found that commonly there's no infant and young child feeding in emergencies prepared plans in place at all. There's no specific training for first responders or for health professionals. There's no investment in IYCFE preparedness, facilities, in the response. There's poor data collection. And there's widespread donations of breast milk substitutes. This has been documented in every country where there's been research on this. Usually do to limited or no enforcement of the international code and limited or no implementation of those operational guidelines that I sh showed you. So I wanted to sum up with this message, which is that investing in breastfeeding is resilience and food security. And the work that everyone here is doing, supporting families day to day, you are working, your work is so important in improving the resilience of all our communities and populations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, really interesting. And I have to, to honestly say personally, really never thought about it in that light. I really never thought about um, disasters and what is happening to uh, mothers and infants so it's really really been encouraging and really eye-opening but at the same time really sad that uh, we don't really have anything in place for this and whilst you were talking and sometimes it's very easy to always think about disasters and think oh well okay it's over there it has nothing to do with me but it has 
it, it has a lot to do with, with everyone. And like you were talking about flooding, today is raining like anything. There might be a flood somewhere. So it's really, really good and interesting to hear this. And again, just add to that um, storyline that we still have a long way to go um, in the UK and it's about time we start doing something. Now, just saying that, um, can I just encourage people uh, who are listening that if you have questions, please put it in the uh, Q&A so Helen can answer. But Helen, I think you've got, you've got, oh, you've got two questions in there. Um, so it says, I'll read it as it is, if that's all right with you. It says, uh, dear Helen, related to training, is there a course in the UK like an MSc or PG set? that um, uh, uh, an IBCLC, so a consultant, breastfeeding consultant, or an infant feeding lead could take us to be specialized in infant feeding emergencies. Um, I will be very interested, but I cannot find something relevant. So um, are you aware of any course? Well, that is a great question. And um, there used to be a five-hour online course offered by the Emergency Nutrition Network, um, but I think that's waiting to be updated with the new, the latest edition of the operational guidance. And um, so, as I said, I've newly joined the Infant Feeding and Emergencies Core Group, and that's definitely one of my questions. Um, I think there are training modules out there. Um, and so I would be really happy to include do a little more research on what's available now. And uh, because I did that other training previously, but it's not available anymore. Um, and I'll share that with Ernestine and she can share that with listeners. Um, it, it isn't um, something that would be a, a master's or a PG cert. It's more like online modules um, at the moment, unless anyone offers in-person training. And I know that LCGB has held a, an in-person workshop in the past. We had Safely Fed Canada come and share with us the experience of their work in Canada and um, the basics of the global guidance. And there is quite often at lactation conferences, uh, or at least the big international ones, they may have a special session on emergencies. Uh, so definitely, if you are going to one of those conferences, look out for that. I know that at ILCA, we've had like a whole day of sessions and workshops on emergencies in the past. Um, but I def it's one of my particular interests to find what sort of training there might be for people on the ground um, that they could do from home, perhaps. Um, and so I will, when I've got the results of my research, I'll share that with Ernestine. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, and again, that's an, another area that is quite interesting, isn't it? Given that um, we are sort of <clears throat> plagued with natural disasters every now and again, and even man-made disasters. So um, not to really have something quite ready and there. It, it's, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so there is another question from another, another from Liz. Uh, she says, First of all, thank you for the insightful talk. Could you comment on whether you think countries need country-specific guidance along with the incorporation of the infant feeding emergency call group operational guidance? <clears throat> Sorry. Well, first of all, I would love to hear Liz uh, speak on this subject herself. Um, but it, certainly in my experience, People need culture-specific guidance and um, resources that they can relate to. Uh, and uh, so the operational guidance is, you know, sort of based on all the evidence in the past emergencies. And um, so it's, it's a very strong resource. But in one country, there may be um, a huge, a much higher percentage of mothers who are um, expressing for their baby. And so they would be in a different situation if there was a um, storm, a power outage or they're evacuated because they've got all their express milk in their freezer. Um, so you really do need to look at, this is why you need that needs assessment and you need your basic data. You need to know what's happening in your community and in your country so that you can tailor the guidance to the needs of the people 
who live there and who are going to be affected by whatever might happen. Um, that doesn't mean that we can just ignore the global guidance and the international code because we actually know they are relevant to our countries. We can't say they're not. Um, there's so many instances where it's very obvious that because those aren't in place, um, infants have been put at risk. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of using that framework from the IFE core group operational guidance, which has really thought through a lot of the aspects of emergencies, and then digging down into your own communities and your own situation um, so that the families find what's relevant to them. I might give one small example, actually. Uh, after the Grenfell fire, I saw an interview with a mother who uh, they were, the council and the fire department were going around the neighboring high rises, asking people to evacuate because they didn't know what had caused the fire and they're afraid there might be a gas explosion or something that might spread to neighboring towers, tower blocks. So they're going floor by floor to these apartment buildings and they're talking to this mother who had a baby and a school-aged child. And they said, everyone needs to evacuate. You need to come down with your children now. We need to go down the stairs because in a fire, you don't use the lift. And she's like, are you kidding? She showed the fireman this entire countertop in her kitchen, which was covered with the sterilizer and the tins of formula and the racks of bottles. And she's like, I'm not climbing down 10 flights of stairs with all that, that's not possible because she got to carry her baby and also she has another child. And the official just keeps saying, well, everyone needs to evacuate. You need to evacuate. Everyone has to evacuate. And it was clear that that um, local authority and those first responders had no idea of what a, a family and their situation would need. Imagine if they'd been able to say right away, Oh, well, over at the community hall, we've got a milk kitchen, we've got sterilizers, we've got plenty of clean bottles, and we have formula. So you don't need to worry about how you're going to get all of that down 10 flights of stairs. Just come now with your baby and your child. Mm -hmm. And and so that, you know, that really, I was like, whoa, here we think we're so advanced um, that we don't have disasters. And yet we haven't even thought of these simple things. And that mother and her family were really at risk. What if there had been a fire? had spread to their tower. And she's in this terrible situation of how do I feed my baby, but I've got to escape and you know, then what? So um, yes, definitely Liz, I think that's such a good point that we need to bring together the global guidance and the evidence and the WHA resolutions and the code and show how we can implement them for our own populations and communities. Thanks. Thank you very much for, for that really, really good um, answer, Helen. Thank you. Um, I think there's no other question apart from thank yous in there. Um, Heather is thanking you and saying that she will pass the information to the uh, her team. She says she's recently been working with uh, volunteering with emergency planners for the local authority and she will be passing um, this and the resources, all the resources we will send, which we will send through to everyone. She will be passing that on to them. So that's really good. Um, and Claire is also just thanking you for the work. I think um, it's really thought provoking, all of this, uh, what you've been talking about. And what really did touch me uh, more is the fact that when there is a disaster, when there is an emergency, uh, Yes, people are very quick to send uh, formula milks and so on, but it's really interesting that actually there hasn't been much thinking. And also you're talking about the first responders and, and trainings. It, it will be really good if trainings like this start to sit through. And just like you mentioned, maybe all our health professionals should really get this training because you really never can tell what sort of emergency you find yourself in so really really useful thank you so much um i think um that's all the questions all what we're seeing in there is praises to you helen and the work that you're doing which is amazing um just to say we've got four minutes to go 
And if we don't have any other question, I just want to, to thank Helen so much for this presentation. I think personally, it's been a real eye opener for me because I didn't think about this, like I said at the very beginning. And it also really good to see how much supporting breastfeeding can help in emergencies like, like that. Um, where there is less support for breastfeeding obviously means there's kind of more support for formula feeding, but there is a lot more that we could be doing. And there is a lot more that can serve uh, mothers, the troubles, and even everybody else that is involved when there is an issue if a mother is uh, breastfeeding. So really, really thank you for that. To encourage uh, all our listeners, just like Helen said, if you have a chance to speak to your local authority, uh, maybe it's time to ask them questions. I mean, we, I think typically in the UK, if we don't want to think about too many things, we can think about the flooding. There are some flooding prone areas. So what is there in place for them? So thank you so much, Helen, and thank you to all our um, listeners. And I just want to say, what can I say? A lot to take away from this talk. And I keep building and mounting on everything that's been going on. So next week, we we'll, our next webinar will be with the doctors. So we will have um, breastfeeding for doctors and some of the members from there talking about breastfeeding uh, at being doctors. We know, again, it goes back to the, our health professionals. They do have their own challenges as well. So thank you all so much. And if you're joining us next week, it will be great to see you. All the recording will be made available. So there's one channel with all the recordings for all the webinars and the documentary itself. So um, if you missed or part of it or you want to revisit, always revisit. If you have a question, I'm sure Helen doesn't mind being contacted. Am I right about that, Helen? Absolutely. Um, um, my Yes, be, feel free to share my email address with any of the attendees who want to talk about it. And I forgot to say that actually um, our WBTI assessment, we're doing the second assessment now of the UK. Um, so looking across England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And we really welcome volunteers for that. And uh, looking into what's happening with, uh, with regard to preparing for emergencies is one of our work strands. So if it's something that's really caught your passion, uh, get in touch because we could use all hands on deck to um, see how far we've come since the 2016 report and what remains to, to be done. We all have work to do. Thank you so much, Ernestine, and thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you to everybody who joined us today. So, well, it's miserable where I am, so I don't know where everybody else is. If you have a good weather, enjoy it. If you have one like mine, grab a cup of tea or coffee and, and chill. But thank you all so much. Thank you. And see you next week. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.